Hello, and welcome to the webinar, In a Nutshell, CA125 and Ovarian Cancer. I'm Maggie Nicholas Alexander, the Senior Director of Gynecologic Cancer, Patient Support, and Education at SHARE. Before the program begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. We're a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone who has been diagnosed with breast or gynecologic cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms. For more information about upcoming webinars, support groups, and our helplines, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. This program is being recorded and it'll be on our website soon. Uh, now I'd like to hand it over to today's speaker to introduce himself. Dr. Richard Penson, welcome. We're so happy to have you here today. Thank you, fabulous to be here. So uh, my name is Richard Penson. I'm a medical oncologist at Mass General Hospital in Boston. It's been my privilege to lead some of the international um, clinical trials in ovarian cancer and other gynecologic tumors, and um, my personal privilege to care for many patients uh, with this disease. So very good to connect today. Great, and so we'll just dive right into our Q&A. So, uh, briefly, what is the CA125? So the CA125 the, it was the 125th attempt to find a good marker in the bloodstream for ovarian cancer. CA stands for cancer antigen or carcinoembryonic antigen. And um, so it's a really clever discovery um, using cancer cells put into mouse spleens and making antibodies against those cancer cells. And so one after another, they failed. But on the 125th attempt, they found this really um, good way of making an antibody test in the bloodstream uh, to identify them. So we typically use the clinical evaluation, this marker, meaning if the cancer gets worse, the marker goes up. If the cancer is responding to treatment or patients going to remission, it goes down. And the CAT scans, those three things, clinical. And it's been a really helpful marker. People have state specific antigen, different biology, um, but uh, in many ways, a very similar marker. Um, not successful for screening, um, but very successful in terms of guiding us through treatments for our patients. Great. And that'll transition us well into the next question, which is, in terms of ovarian cancer, how is the, the blood test used? So um, the molecule itself is a, a what's called glycoprotein, meaning it's a, a tree of protein on the surface of the um, of the cancer cells, and it's partly just a lubricant thing. It sort of makes the um, tissues like the pink glistening lining of the mouth, um, but it's got important cancer driving and immunologic functions as well. We're actually starting to use it as a target for immunotherapy, which is very exciting. But for most patients, um, what it really means is part of the diagnostic and part of the therapeutic process. So if you have a lump in the pelvis, MRI is slightly better than um, ultrasound, but CA125 is a very discriminatory marker. So if you are postmenopausal women, um, uh, you really need any ovarian lump taking out. If you have an elevated CA125, you need any lump uh, taking out. So it's helpful diagnostically. It's elevated. Uh, a bad one is an elevated one over mm -hmm. 35 uh, units per mil. Um, uh, and then uh, probably a bad, bad one is over 500. But there's no real correlation. The higher it goes, the worse it is. But there's not like a threshold for a bad one. We worked really hard to try and define that. And 500 is about the closest that we ever got. And as I said, when it comes down, there's celebration and horror if it goes up. And uh, it's not always a perfect marker, uh, but most commonly it does identify Occurrence of disease when it goes up. Great, thank you. Um, and can it be elevated outside the normal range for reasons other than cancer? Yeah, so up to 20% of the time. So, for example, early stage disease, up to 50% of the time, it's an unhelpful marker. You've got a small early cancer, and the CM5 may be inaccurate. But for advanced disease, sometimes it's not very accurate. And it can be what we 
what you're referring to, a false positive result. So I've had patients whose thyroid has become dysfunctional during treatment, and that's caused um, an elevation of the CA125. Or taking um, excess vitamins and having a hurt liver has driven up uh, the CA125 in a patient. And it can be caused by other cancers. So uh, any abdominal epithelial cancer and lobular breast cancer. We find it on those glistening surfaces, the lining of the abdomen called the peritoneum that covers the ovary. It's also on the eye, so some eye conditions. I have actually never seen a patient with a false positive from that sort of thing, but it's theoretically a concern. As I said, with targeted therapy, that may identify another sort of side effect, a collateral damage in treatment um, in terms of consequences for when we're attacking the CA125. Great, thank you. And does the num numerical value of the CA125 correlate to the amount of disease present? So if it's slightly elevated, a small amount of disease and high, under, high numbers would indicate a lot of disease? Yeah, so there is a correlation between the two. Um, so the, it was developed 40 years ago, just, just more than 40 years ago, 1981. And in the 90s, there was a lot of work done. Actually, when I came to Mass General 25 years ago, the two projects I was working on was new drugs and seeing if we could work out the math of changes in the normal range. So imagine you do really well, the c 5 comes down, it's back to normal, under 35. And there's been various studies that have shown that under 20, under 15, under 12 under 10 is better. The lower, the better. Um, and if your family's CO15 normally is at, say, 25, you have radical surgery stripping out a lot of the tissue in the pelvis, the uterus, um, fallopian tubes, and ovaries, and your CO15 will go down a bit. There's a new, what we call steady state, the sort of average amount. I have patients who have seven, 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 seven. Other patients who much more terrifyingly, you know, 11, 18, 14, 16, those, that's a sort of roller coaster, an emotional um, roller coaster. And so we had a big project trying to do the math of predicting, okay, if it goes from seven to nine, what's the next one going to be? And as is common in biology, there's so much variation that that is hard to sort out mathematically. There are reasons uh, for the sort of math change, uh, like what we call the asymptotic approach to a new baseline as it approaches a new steady state, um, a new flat level, um, but, it, but it's imperfect, the math. And so uh, a rise in the CM25, somebody, some people have used more than um, two times. Some people have used more than two times the upper limit of normal. So if it goes over 70. So for example, those um, antibody studies, the bispecifics from Regeneron that target CA125, you can't get into the studies unless your CA125 is over 70. And that actually comes from that sort of history and developing um, an understanding of CA125. Um, a, a group from the from Scandinavia, Bo Grunland and his group um, did a really nice study and they compared um, in the setting of recurrent disease, um, the CA125 with CAT scans. So you think, you know, you feel well, but it's, but it's disconcerting. Could cancer be lurking? A silent killer is a horrible name that has been attributed to ovarian cancer. Could cancer be lurking? And so if you had to choose between a CA125 that went back to normal and a CAT scan that went back to normal, Dr. Gunland's team um, showed that the CA125 was 2.6 times as accurate in terms of predicting survival. So in that study, more than a third of patients were cured in frontline therapy. And so they follow people with frontline, with platinum-based therapy, and um, on Topatika, a drug we almost never use now for recurrent disease. But they sort of worked out those metrics. And so it's not to be forgotten that the CO25 um, is often more accurate than the CAT scan. A CAT scan can have thickenings that are scar tissue. I, a few times every week in clinic, I have patients who are terrified by um, scans that aren't perfect. It's all too common to have a scan that's not perfect. A CA125 that goes back to normal is much more of a relief for the physician and for their patient. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And that's also sort of another good segue to our next question, um, which is do gynecologic oncologists treat for a recurrence solely based on an, ele on an elevated CA125 for example, in cases where there is no evidence of disease on a scan. 
So that situation, what we call an asymptomatic rising CA125, when the patient is well, they have no symptoms from their cancer, um, is is a sort of controversial area. But now, actually, since the development of CA125, we've really refined a lot of that information. So Gordon Rustin was a fabulous um, investigator from the United Kingdom, and he actually has the criteria for a response on scans named after him, the Rustin criteria. So CA125 halves, and then a month later is half as, um, as low again, you know, it halves a second time. That's got a partial response. And progression is doubling of the CA125 and doubling again. Um, actually, no, sorry, my apologies, 20% worse and 20% um, uh, worse and more than a month later. So those Rustin criteria were developed to see if we could evaluate things. In the era where we use targeted therapies and particularly the anti-angiogenic bevacizumab, previously Avastin, now uh, generics have replaced that essentially. Uh, but bevacizumab um, really made a bit of a difference to how we look after patients by six months on average. You can use it multiple times. It's a really effective therapy, but it really did alter the outcomes. It delayed recurrence without necessarily impacting overall survival. For example, frontline doesn't impute the chance of you being cured, but might make patients with stage four disease or lots of ascites um, live longer. And the FDA actually shut down the whole endeavor to use CA125 as a marker of outcomes. So for clinical trials, we use CAT scans and we have dropped using CA125 as a marker. In that setting where four or five months before um, the CA125 is rising, we sort of know there's going to be recurrence of disease. We have used lots of things, hormonal things, tiny doses of things, immunotherapeutics, combinations of things, less toxic things. Um, we haven't really got like a successful intervention, but it's still an opportunity. Say this whole endeavor to get immunotherapy to work better, that's a setting where the least volume of disease might be good. It's very controversial. It might be that you need enough cancer to mm -hmm. be sensed by your immune system as you activate it. So effective immunotherapy might actually need some cancer around mm -hmm. to get the best outcome. Gordon Rustin completed his work with an absolutely beautiful study, 1,400 women. We, we, we recruited patients this in England 30 years ago when I was in training. And so these 1,400 women wonderfully volunteered and they got sort of separated down to just over over 500 women and they were randomized so half the patients um, both them the doctor and the, the lab the lab did know the result but they didn't pass it on to the doctor or the patient whether the co 5 was going up and the anticipation would be that the treatment would be later in that group the early treatment would be a reflex to the rising ca125 and so in that group on average five Point six months after uh, the CO25 started to rise in the late treatment group, um, chemotherapy was um, started. And so even though you started chemotherapy later, the patients live for a similar time, not statistically significantly different, and actually two months longer. So when you start chemo, the old toxic chemotherapy, um, prematurely based on the CO25 in a well patient, you are spoiling um, their quality of life for on average five months and not impacting their overall survival. And it really changed the culture, a much more patient-centered, let's make people well and maximize their quality of life and the quantity of life with treatment. In reality, our treatments have got so much better that we need to rethink some of those things. But in terms of classical chemotherapy, that was a definitive study. Great. Thank you so much. And we, it looks like we have one minute left. So we did get one question live that I wouldn't mind if you can, uh, would answer. And so this person is asking about, what about a CA-125 of over 260? So the, the higher it is, the worse it is. You want to find something that's, that if you think about a train down a track, fast, fast. It's going hard and fast. You want to slow it down, stop it, turn it around. You want it to be going down. Um, but it's not as bad as over 500. Mm -hmm. I think the worst one I ever had was over 900,000 in a patient of mine. So they can be horribly high. There's always somebody who has a better one than you, always somebody who has a worse one than you. Um, but it is a point of reference. It is part of understanding your disease and being well supported well-informed, having a plan, having options really gives, it, 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 it engenders 
a sense of control in you that you see you can cope. So be informed about your CA-105. In a nutshell, take control <laughs> and uh, get the best of care. Great. Thank you so much. And I think that's a good takeaway to really be informed about your individual CA-125. Um, yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. Penson, for this brief but super informative program. Uh, we really appreciate it. And then anyone viewing, uh, make sure to check out SHARE's upcoming educational programs and support groups and follow us on social media as well. This concludes today's program. Thanks again, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.